little bit lagged um, from our end, but I'll go ahead and start. We're going to start right on time at one o'clock. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We are in for a real treat today. Um, Erica Millette, who is the owner of Expansion Solutions Consulting, Kandake Tech, and Beyond the Ball, yes, three companies, is an incredible businesswoman with a passion for her community. In this session, we will learn from her how to start, build, and grow businesses of different industries, and we'll have time at the end for your questions as well. Um, I'll let Erica introduce herself, and then we'll get started with some of the questions, but again, we are really in for a treat today. So, Erica? Hi, everyone. As you said, Erica Mollett, CEO of Expansion Solutions, a workforce and economic development consulting firm. Uh, Beyond the Ball, a nonprofit that works with youth in our communities to expose them to careers in math and science and tied sports, as well as Kandake Tech, a new ed tech company. Amazing. Great. Well, we'll just start off with kind of, again, all three companies are very different, um, but I'd love to know, and I'm sure our audience would too, how did you come up with each business idea? Well, you know, I would say that uh, it was really organic. I don't think anyone initially just signs up for the chaos of being a serial entrepreneur. Uh, <laughs> it just, things begin to evolve. And when opportunities come, you just make a decision on if it's time to take advantage of them. So starting with Expansion Solutions, I actually started Expansion Solutions in 2017. And I wanted to combine my experience in commercial banking and working with small businesses and businesses with up to 20 million in revenues and understanding what they needed to grow uh, with my experience in economic development in the Dallas region. Uh, and then my experience as a mom and in working with education. And so we do workforce and economic development consulting. Our clients can be uh, cities or school districts, colleges and universities, real estate developers that want to combine social elevation with their economic development projects in certain communities. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, as, when I jumped out there, a lot of the colleagues that I'd worked with in economic development and municipal leadership uh, brought me on and said, hey, we have projects that you can help us with. And so that's been pretty exciting to just take a, a blank screen and be able to create these multifaceted projects, primarily uh, with, for expansion solutions at least, that bring together the private sector and the needs of a growing company. Let's say, for example, you know, a large manufacturing company that's coming to town or, um, or a large engineering firm that needs to start attracting and building a pipeline of young talent with schools and communities so that they can all grow together. Mm -hmm. uh, Beyond the Ball was purely inspired by my older son, Kyle, who's 15 now. And uh, growing up, he, he kind of liked sports. He wouldn't sit down and watch them with his dad. He'd rather <laughs> play, you know, play with his toys, watch cartoons, uh, go outside and go hiking. But at around 10 years old, he really started to be really passionate about basketball. And all of his science goals of being a chemist like my dad or his dreams of doing cosplay and things like that kind of got sidelined. And he narrowly focused on his hoop dreams. And for me as a mom who works in economic and workforce development, uh, it concerned me because I know that there are so many minority boys in particular who go through their education. They may get good grades. Uh, they, they have great attendance and citizenship and things like that. But mentally, they have that one aspiration that really drives them and it becomes their identity. And if, if that comes to a point and they are part of that 98% that doesn't make it to the NFL or right. doesn't make it to the NBA, then they're devastated and they're lost without a purpose. And I didn't want that to be when you can just look at sports and see so many opportunities beyond the court of the field. And so I, you know, I didn't have a choice but to start beyond the ball because I've only got three years left with them. At that time, I had five years. So, you know, when I talk about not volunteering for the chaos, but just being driven towards it, I had to create Beyond the Ball because I wanted to help him see that, hey, you can still love science and be an athlete, and maybe it'll lead to a career in sports medicine, or you can still love Legos and engineering, and maybe you'll design stadiums one day. Uh, and so for every kid out there, boys and girls who love sports, 
really being able to give them an opportunity to connect with mentors and CEOs and creatives in the spaces around them that can uh, really help them to see all of these options that are ahead of them uh, has been really cool. So we partner with Nike, PlayStation, Xbox, the NBA, uh, lots of different companies who have the same mission, who want to be more than a transaction to these kids, but also inspire them and then welcome them to the table uh, when they graduate from high school and college. Uh, and then Kandake Tech, another non-voluntary uh, opportunity <laughs> that I just had to take on. Uh, as I've been building beyond the ball, I had so many families like mine who had resources mm -hmm. uh, who weren't necessarily the target audience. They're of all races, all socioeconomic backgrounds, all gender, both genders. They weren't necessarily the target audience for Beyond the Ball, but they still have the exact same problem, that they had a kid at home who was no longer excited about learning or inspired by uh, the education platforms that were available to them. So, you know, most, most of what they were learning, for example, my younger son, Tyler. Tyler's 13, he's a gamer. I was concerned at first, and until uh, <laughs> yeah. the day I heard him and his friend saying, hey, maybe we should like build our gaming, build a gaming PC so we can be better gamers. And I said, oh, we'll pay a thousand dollars to help you to build that first gaming PC. Because to me, I thought, oh my God, my kid's about to be an electrical engineer next week. And so, uh, you know, there are so many kids like him who if we are able to lean into their passions and help them to learn now how to do some things that can actually contribute to future careers by purely leveraging what they already love, uh, right. that we could inspire them. And so Kandake Tech was built because I needed to create a marketplace ed tech platform for every family to access uh, and to be able to blend math and science, for example, inside of Steph Curry's jump shot or <laughs> Kyle, my son's jump shot and help them to be able to see the algebraic equations that are there or for kids like Tyler to be able to teach other kids how to build their own gaming PC, or for kids who may have cognitive or physical differences to be able to teach kids things that they are excellent at and often are overlooked for. And so uh, Kandake Tech is about almost a year old and we are launching our first education platform called Banaki.com this year. And so we're really excited about it. It's got a lot of kid produced content so that families who are like, I don't know how I feel about YouTube or Instagram or TikTok, but I want my kid to have that social experience. They can check that box for kids who say, mom, I don't want to go to this platform or that platform to learn math and science because it's boring. Well, this checks off the boxes for them as well. And we are working really closely with the top names in the esports industry and in the entertainment industry and others to really make sure that the platform has a great alignment with this generation's culture and where they find entertainment and inspiration. And we wanna just bottle all of that up and then give them an elevated education experience. So there it is, those are the three. <laughs> I love it. That's, I love that you said, I have to, I had to create this company. I think that that is such an important thing, you know, of, yeah, there's great things that moms think about, but the fact that you went out and did it, I think is just so inspiring to me. And I know to our audience as well, I'd love for you to touch a little bit on how you came up with the name Kandake. I know that um, personally, but I think it's a, a great story too. So I'd love for you to explain how you came up with that name. Sure. Well, you know, I'm a non-tech founder. Uh, I bring no expertise to the table other than being a mom who really pays attention to her kids. And so I wanted a name for the company and a, a good friend of mine and I uh, just searched like what name could mean something and still sound very tech-like. And Kandake means queen mother in Nubian. And so, so I just thought that was perfect. It, was, it sounded perfect. It was catchy. It was easy to say, and it had a lot of meaning behind it that kind of shows how mother's heart, if you will, is driving this forward. Yeah, I love that. That's such a great story. And I, I, that kind of leads me, you know, into my next question. What's it like to be a mom and an entrepreneur? I mean, 
it feels like there's so many things that you're so involved with your kids and listening to them, um, but also you're driving these forces behind all these companies. So what's it like to, to do that? And how do you even start to balance that? Man, you know, I've given up on trying to balance anything here. <laughs> <laughs> I've given up on the word balance, but what I will say is that it's been a real blessing that God's given me ideas for entrepreneurship that allow me to actually grow closer to my kids, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so being a mom and an entrepreneur, it's in this stage, it's been very fun because, you know, you know, one day may be, hey boys, we need to go to the esports arena and I need you to play video games for an hour so I can get some footage. You know, they're like, oh, poor us, right? <laughs> Or we've got to go to a really expensive sneaker store and like analyze the sneaker market because we're going to do a podcast on sneaker heads. And maybe you might get some shoes out of this. Uh, or just staying up last night, for example. I was up at four o'clock in the morning with my 13-year-old who is a complete night owl. And I couldn't go to sleep because he wanted to talk about race cars and what's under the hoods and what makes this race car so fast. And so I'm listening and I'm taking notes like, okay, note to self, we've got to get a NASCAR driver to do a podcast with Tyler to talk about cars and what makes them so fast and add math equations to that. And so, you know, it's, it's been great because I've been able to do that. Now, the other side is that when it's time to do the unfun stuff, you know, the business and the reports and all of those types of things, uh, that's when it's, when kids are at home during a pandemic as virtual learners, it can be hard to focus. Uh, and so sometimes I have to go to my office at SMU or I just have to take, thankfully they're teenagers, so they don't want all of my attention. Uh, but you know, you really got to get in that zone. And so, so, you know, there is that balance and, and then being able to just stop thinking about business altogether, stop pestering the family about business sometimes and just sitting down watching Avengers, which we did last night, we watched Infinity <laughs> Wars, and then we watched Endgame, you know, and just leave the phones alone. Uh, that balance can be challenging. And I'll say the, the most challenging part right now is knowing that education is freaking hard for kids. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's their confidence is waning right now because even the best students are struggling to perform and teachers are struggling to teach. And school districts are struggling to manage these. So, you know, it's like it all rolls downhill. And when the, that kid is in your home and you have to make sure that you that you turn off the business mind and, and turn off the mommy mind and be an educator, I'll be honest, I'm not a teacher. I am not the best. I have an ed tech company, but I have teachers on staff that help with that. In fact, these teachers are helping me with one of my sons right now in his education. And so it's really just taken a village to be able to quote unquote balance it all. Uh, but this, you know, in, in, a, in a pandemic, you know, what's been most important to me as a mom is to make sure that my kids feel happy and validated. And they were already smart kids. So, you know, no matter what this year shakes out to look like, they'll be okay. Um, and, and then just giving myself some grace and saying, Hey, e, it's okay. It's okay. You're going to win some days. You're going to lose some days. You're going to win and lose on this day and then lose and win <laughs> the next day. It's all going to happen in the exact same 24 hours and it's all good. It'll be okay. Yeah. I love that. Courtney in the chat said that she agrees. I don't use the word balance, but rhythm instead. And I, I love that too. I think just remembering Gosh, you just have touched on how it's, you got to remember the important things. Um, and, and that ultimately that's your kids and you already know that they're smart. And so just enhancing their education, but using your resources, I think is a great rhythm that you've been using. Um, so as a woman and an entrepreneur of color, I'm sure that there are many challenges that you face, especially in the business world that, that tends to be, you know, controlled by white men in, in our business world. And so as a woman, an entrepreneur of color, what challenges do you face in the business world specifically? Gosh, you know, it's hard to answer that question the way that one would expect me to answer it at this stage of my companies, because they're still small. You know, I haven't gotten to the point where I'm facing the 
systematic racism that we and sexism that we know faces women uh, when we go after VC dollars. Yeah, I haven't even gotten to that point. Um, but at this stage, I can say that I have had so many people, men, white men, black men, white women, Asian men, you name it, who have just connected and supported me heart to heart, mission to mission. And so um, the, the hard part of being a woman of color and being an entrepreneur and being a mom is knowing that every day that I'm out here trying to build a better world for my kids and to prepare them to give the world their best, uh, it's very disheartening to know that that same world may not be ready to embrace my boys the way uh, they deserve to be embraced. That keeps me up at night. And that causes me to work really hard to, to bridge the divide and to, you know, I, I have conversations with CEOs of Fortune 500 companies every once in a while, uh, who I just simply meet on LinkedIn and have heart to heart conversations with them. Say, you know, I understand your heart is to have diversity and your heart is to make sure there's equity in your workplace but your gatekeeper may be your HR department or your gatekeeper may be the manager that's managing them on the ground level. Um, perhaps you should talk to some of these organizations that are uh, focused on women and minorities in your industry. You say you can't find them. So that maybe in the next five years, I will have moved the needle a little bit so that my kids are ready to move into a, a better world. Um, but I, but I would be doing an injustice to Peter and to Eric and to all of the people. Uh, and you, your question was specifically uh, about white male-driven industries like tech. Um, I'd be doing it this justice, injustice if I didn't say that they have been so supportive. And I think that oftentimes the Trey Bowles, Will Akins, I mean, your colleagues, you know, I've, I've received nothing but support when I've asked for it. And, and they've even fought alongside of me when it seemed like something wasn't being done that was fair to me. Um, and so I think that what maybe the audience can learn from that is that there are so many good people out there that have the same heart, even if they don't have the same skin color or experiences in life. And if we can just, sometimes you just have to reach out heart to heart and ask for help. Uh, the DEC program, you know, you guys connected me with Peter Bartnick, who's been like the mentor extraordinaire. Like you guys have a mentor of the year award and you like make statues. There should be one of Peter Bartnick. <laughs> um, and we've tried, Peter and I have cried together during, you know, the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And we've tackled these conversations, which, you know, I think is what we have to do. We all have to tackle these conversations together. And so, uh, but yeah, but I, you know, I, being a woman, being a minority has been to my benefit. I have nothing but joy and appreciation for those two labels being a part of my journey. And uh, yeah, because at the end of the day, God made me all of that. And then he's using all of that to help me to be successful. And so I hope that answers your question. But yes, if anyone out here is listening and you have control over corporations and systematic races, situations that are happening in your organizations, please fix them. Please fix them because, you know, the world is only better when we all work together and appreciate what we have to bring to the table. Uh, but so far, God has blessed me to navigate and meet the right people. Yeah, that's great. I, I love just how you touch on, oh my gosh, there's so many people who are fighting for exactly what I'm fighting for, no matter what the color of their skin is or what job they're in or those sorts of things. Um, I, I, I think of the phrase for you of being the change you wish to see in the world. And gosh, I think that you and the people that you've gotten to work with are doing those things. And so we're grateful for that too. And, and touching on that as well. Um, so you have all these people in your corner. Um, and so how do you support them? How do you support other entrepreneurs like you or not like you? Yeah. You know, that's a good question because, you know, I, I feel about the entrepreneurial community the same way I feel about sisterhoods, the same way I feel about family networks. We're all in this together. Um, and 
being an entrepreneur, it's lonely in these streets, right? It's very lonely to be an entrepreneur because when you're at home, you know, you're sitting in your blue chair and all you got is a piece of paper and a pencil and you're trying to come up with the next big idea or you're trying to figure out a problem. Uh, oftentimes you can feel like the people around you, if they're not also entrepreneurs, it can feel as though they don't understand. They don't understand why you don't have time to go hang out. They don't understand why you don't um, have more money. They don't understand why you haven't changed out of your pajamas in a week. Um, you know, they don't understand how to help you find access to capital or to help you figure out these business problems. And, but being surrounded by other entrepreneurs, it helps you to move through that. And to know that you're not alone. And maybe the problem that you have today, someone else has already figured out right before you. And the same goes the other way. You may have figured something out that you can share with others. And so I would say at least on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, there are different entrepreneurs that I talk to. In fact, one of my, one of them was, uh, I was during the DEX uh, startup week, you guys had the the matchmaker thing where you just press the button and it randomly puts you in the room with someone else and you guys start talking. Well, it connected me with a guy named Hadi and Hadi was just fascinating. And, you know, I had a question, you know, I think it was only a three minute window before you were, you know, you were separated, but we connected on LinkedIn and every once in a while we'll do coffee or we'll do a call and he may say, hey, this is what I'm struggling with today. And we'll make the whole time we're talking about his business. And he's in a completely different business than I am. He creates these really cool pods um, for uh, to, to go in coffee shops so that entrepreneurs can have a safe and quiet place to zone out, but still be around other people. And so, you know, one day we may be talking about how does he take that national or the next day might be about me needing to create an eat because he is an app developer and a web developer. So, you know, I think that as entrepreneurs, you just got to bring what you have to the table. And sometimes you got to say, today is not about me. It's about me listening to you and helping you with your business. And it feels great to do that because you're like, okay, I do know, know a few things. I may be confused in my own business, but I was able to help someone else figure out something in theirs. And so, yeah, brainstorming with other entrepreneurs, crying, laughing, celebrating with them. You know, I think my, if LinkedIn were to do a search, my, my most used term would be, I'm so proud of you. And just, you know, anytime I see one of my colleagues on LinkedIn doing something amazing, letting them know that I'm proud of them. Keep going. You got this, you know, and uh, cause we all have, it's an emotional roller coaster. And so we just, we just have to be there for one another. Yeah. I love that. You kind of touched on this already too, but how important is it to be a part of that entrepreneurial community? I mean, again, you've already touched on this of just supporting each other and making sure, you know, that you can do this, but how important is that for you? And then to be a part of that community. You know, and, and I'll speak on community from a different angle this time and talk about the deck, uh, SMU's incubator, uh, Texas Women's University and their, uh, their, the, the Center for Women's Entrepreneurship. Being a part of those types of, the, the badass women's group on Facebook, uh, you know, being a part of those types of circles lets you know that you've always got someone that's got your back, you know. Um, it's different than just knowing a few entrepreneurs in your community or having a few entrepreneurs in your family. I know if something's going down and I really need some help, I can call the deck, I can call SMU, I can call TWU, and they will help me figure it out because they, that's, that's what they do. That's what they eat, sleep, and breathe is supporting entrepreneurs like me. And I think that, uh, you know, before the pandemic and when I was actually a full-time employee of another company, um, it was hard for me to participate in events that a lot of the entrepreneurial uh, organizations like yourselves had, right? Because I'm working all day and then I got to go home, pick up kids. So I can't come to the networking events. Uh, but with the, during the pandemic, it's been a lot easier to take advantage of those opportunities. A, because you know, half my business clients went away for a few months after the pandemic started. But I had plenty of time and you guys had so many virtual resources and events and grants and things like that for us to take advantage of. So I would say for the audience that typically, and I'm assuming if, if some of my network is watching this, they may not be really aware of the deck. 
Um, but there are so many resources out there that often I have associated with, oh, I've got to be a, a 20 something white guy who's working out of my garage on this really innovative company in order to be a part of the deck. You know, it's not really for 40 something year old moms in the suburbs, uh, but it has been, and it has taken not, not just my business to the next level. It's also taken my mindset to the next level because I've been able to learn from different perspectives. And so I would say that's the real benefit of being a part of an entrepreneurial community. Hey, you've got this group of people who are being paid from nine to five to focus on growing you and supporting you. Uh, and then you always know that you have a community that's rooting for you so you don't feel so lonely. Wow, thank you so much for all those kind words you said about the deck. And I'm glad that those resources have helped you and also the fellow entrepreneurs. I didn't tell you I was gonna ask you this question, but I really would love to hear a little bit more about your mentor because you you say that he needs to get this award for yes, best mentor you. this year, but I'd love to hear a little bit about him so you can touch on that relationship as well. I would love to talk about him. And I actually have two more mentors from the deck uh, since Peter and I were, were introduced. But Peter Bartnick, uh, when he first, when we first had our call, I noticed an accent. He's Australian. And, um, and so he, you know, he just, he immediately gravitated to the idea that I had. I'm like, look, you know, it's kind of got sports. It's kind of got tech. It's for kids. He's like, hey, I've worked in tech. I've worked in sports in Australia with, with, with youth. This is very much a part of my passion. Let's get started. And he's literally walked alongside me since we were connected in maybe April or May. We talk text at least weekly. And he, he's just been a tremendous asset in helping me take it from just this little concept to a real business model. And sometimes he overwhelms me with things that I need to consider and decisions I need to make. And <laughs> But that's... <laughs> Thing. That's a good thing because, you know, quite frankly, I did tell him, I said, you know, I want you to tell me how the white boys will do this. I want to know how it's being done. Uh, not saying that I want to pattern my entire trajectory after someone else. You know, my path is going to be my path. But if we as women or we as minorities aren't getting access or if we're not building businesses that to the level and degree that others are, then we kind of need to know what they're doing so that we can say, okay, that sounds like something I probably should consider or ah, that works for them, but it may not work for me. And so he's done that. He's really helped me to a high level, not just a high level compared to a white man, but compared to companies that have really grown to a level that I'd love to grow to that happen to my, primarily be run by white men. And so, you know, so he's, he's just been, he's been a true caring person. It hasn't just been about business. You know, he knew that Kyle loved basketball. He's like, oh, I'll come over and train him on Sundays. You know, I'll come to his games. And I didn't even ask him to do that. He just, he just wanted to, you know, and, uh, and so, yeah, he's just been such a cheerleader, you know, when, like I said, when everything has been going on with the racial divide and social injustice, uh, he didn't shy away from talking about it and saying how much it angered him and hurt him. And we were really able to just kind of build a real authentic relationship. I uh, also have Denise Loveway, who is amazing. And Eric Swain, who is a part of your network, who happened to see one of the articles that you guys did about me and say, hey, I love the concept. I'm a dad, I've got three kids and I get it. And I feel like they deserve something better in the world too. And so, yeah, so I've, I've had some great, great mentors. Jen Ebinger from SMU Incubator, she runs that program there. She and Camille have been amazing as well. Tracy Irby from TWU. There's just so many great people out there trying to do some big things with us. Yeah, that's great. And Jennifer is actually on here and she says, thank you for all the kind words about the incubator at SMU. So she's on here and she gave, uh, she's here for your little shout out for her. So that's great. I have just two final questions, um, but then we'll get to some from the chat and there have been some great questions come in as well. But these last two are really kind of overarching. What do you wish you knew earlier in your career? That's a good one. 
And I'm glad I read that question before you asked it so that I could not go on a tangent. Because here's the answer that I think I'd give. And, and when I mentor young people, uh, college students and set in high school students, I would say that I wish I'd known when I was younger that it was all going to work out. That it was all going to work out. You know, when you graduate from high school, you have no idea what college is going to be like. Uh, and then when you graduate from college, you have no idea if all the dreams you've had for your life are going to pan out. <laughs> and that lasts you all the way through your 20s, right? You're like, am I going to find a man or am I going to find a woman? Am I going to actually be the CEO of anything one day? Uh, you know, my first, my starter job isn't that glamorous. I thought I had all these hopes for myself. My community thought I was going to be amazing. I am sucking wind right now. Uh, it can cause you a lot of sleepless nights that you don't even have to have. You just have to keep moving forward. And I would just say that, you know, every job that I've had, and I've had a lot of jobs in internships starting in college, every one of them built a piece of me for the future. And even if that job didn't seem glamorous or it didn't seem like it was going to lead anywhere or if I had a horrible boss or if I felt like I didn't get opportunities to advance like I expected, mm -hmm. it was all still a part of the path that led to where I am today, you know? And so the problems that I had or leaving one job and going to the next or losing a job and then having to feel like I'm starting over like I would literally never have had the highs in life and in my careers that I've had if I'd stayed if I'd stayed with certain companies or if I hadn't taken a risk. And I would also say that sometimes the biggest opportunities, the biggest ideas that you're going to have will be birthed out of struggle. Because mm -hmm. when you're comfortable, you're not ideating. You know, you're not, you're not trying to come up with the next big thing if you don't have a problem to solve. That's what entrepreneurship is. It's solving a problem. You got to have a problem first in order to solve one. And so, you know, I, the older I got and the more I started to realize that probably in my 30s, you know, I finally figured that out. I started to appreciate problems. Yeah, they still sucked and they were problematic. But I would always say, all right, God, well, something big is about to come out of this. You don't know what it'll be. Uh, and being broke, it's okay. Just enjoy life. Enjoy your youth so that you have no regrets because there's really never a such thing as success, honestly. Um, you may accomplish something. I won't say there's no such thing as success. There's no such thing as arriving because mm -hmm. as soon as you reach that next goal, then there's still a whole nother one to reach. And the one you just reached doesn't feel as important or as magnanimous as you thought it would because you have to work so freaking hard to get there. It's kind of like having a big event. Uh, you know, I've hosted lots of events or know people who've had big galas or concerts and the performer is the one setting up the stage. The performer is the one who had to do everything and then they go behind stage, they change clothes, they probably didn't even get to take a shower and then they get on the stage and they perform for you and you're looking at them like, oh my God, their life must be so amazing. They just have a performance. And when the performance is over, they go home and they cry themselves to sleep because it was so hard, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's kind of what success can feel like sometimes. You finally get that big break on your job and there's so much work that went into getting the job and keeping the job. And so if you didn't enjoy every part of the process until that moment, and you don't enjoy every part of the process until you get to that day when the Lord calls you home, I guess, then you will have missed out on the whole point of life. And so, you know, if you have a big project and it's going to keep you up all night, don't be like, oh my God, this project is going to keep me up all night. Think, I'm so fortunate that I'm working on a project for a job that I've wanted. This is really cool. And man, what am I going to learn from this that's going to help build my portfolio? And have fun with your coworkers. Have fun with your friends and family. Don't just live on Red Bulls and until you reach this big magical day of success. Enjoy every moment. And otherwise, you'll just be miserable and you may have money, but your health will suffer. You suffer. Your family and friends will suffer. And so I think that's what I would say. Everything's going to be all right. You are going to be successful. All you got to do is keep trying and enjoy the ride. Yeah, that's great. I love the language that you use of 
instead of I have to do something, I get to do something, you know, I think that's what's tough too, whenever you're grinding and trying to get stuff done and you have this goal, but ultimately you will get there. And so I love that language that you use there. Um, And especially I would love to hear what your best piece of advice is that you could give to aspiring entrepreneurs, one, but also just our community and network as a whole. I think that you have great advice to give both of those networks. Gosh, let's see. I would say to aspiring entrepreneurs to uh, talk to some current entrepreneurs before you take that big leap. I talked to a lot of people like, man, I just want to quit my job tomorrow and be an entrepreneur like you. And I'm like, girl, or maybe don't, don't just leap. Because guess what? You will never remember what day is the first and the 15th of the month because no one's sending you a check. <laughs> uh, you, <laughs> case, all of those things go out of the window. The stability of knowing that someone else is going to make sure the lights are on in the building and that your desk is set up and all of that stability goes out of the window. Mm-hmm. Entrepreneurship is beautiful in concept. Um, and it can be, the, the ride is beautiful if you choose to feel that way, but it is, it's hard work. It's harder work than working for someone else. And you never make as much money as you think you will as quickly as you think you will. Mm-hmm. And so if you have some savings set aside, if you can start growing that business as a side hustle, but building it with the right business principles in place, uh, then take that leap. Because, you know, sometimes some of us, we become entrepreneurs out of desperation or out of circumstance. Maybe you were laid off and you're like, well, I don't want to deal with that again. I'll just go for it. And that's beautiful. But if you have a runway, take advantage of that. Secondly, I would say, uh, don't be afraid to ask for help. I know a lot of people around the world. And I would tell you the number one place that I've met them is in their direct messages on LinkedIn. (laughs) <laughs> just from sending messages and you know and i think it's because the value proposition i'm bringing is hey can we change the lives of some kids together or you know i'm working on this project and you know i'm not asking you for money but i would love some advice or i'd love for you to inspire some kids that we're working with um if you really reach out to people with an authentic heart uh then people will help you and so you don't have to do this alone but make sure you're also using the right business principles. You know, uh, track your money, do your research. There is so much you can find just on Google alone uh, to help in YouTube and other places to help you grow your business. There's no reason to, to feel like you don't have what it takes, even when you don't have access to certain people. There's the information is still out there. Right. Absolutely. That's great. Gosh, I, I have really mic dropped just, you just mic dropped there. So I don't have anything to follow up with that, but I'll get to um, some of the questions from the audience and everyone, please feel free to continue to send some questions in the chat. And I also want to read this to you, Erica, from Tracy, since I know you can't see this. Um, she says, thanks for the shout out, TWU Center for Women Entrepreneurs. Thanks the world of you. It's a great time to be an entrepreneur and there are so many great resources for small business. So. I love that she's here with us. Yes. So, yeah. So first question is from Raquel and she asks, what would be one of your biggest recommendations for women entrepreneurs? You know, you know, sometimes you hear uh, women entrepreneurs say, look, I'm not just a woman entrepreneur. I'm not just a woman CEO. I'm just a CEO. I'm just an entrepreneur. Right. And I think that the hard part about answering a question like that is the same advice I'd give a woman, I would give a man um, because there's really no difference in us as business people. Um, but I guess I would say to give yourself some grace, if you are a woman entrepreneur that feels like you're balancing more in your household than a typical single non, let's say non-child having person, um, give yourself some grace. You know, I decided a long time ago, I wasn't trying to build an Oprah empire. Uh, The sacrifices that come with that and all of that, I'm not willing, I love taking naps. And (laughs) so if if I'd have to have a world where I never got to take a nap, you know, I'm not signing up for that. So build your business 
at your own speed. But at the same time, don't give yourself, the reason I don't like the label of women this and women that often is because it can almost give you internally this excuse or an out to say, well, you know, I, I'm growing slow because I'm a woman owned business. No, we can move with just as much of a sense of urgency if we choose to. You can slow down if you choose to. Mm -hmm. um, if this week you have to just go all in and focus on your kids or on you or on your family or just on your girl time, you know, Kendall and I were just talking about girl time, you know, then do that. It's okay. It'll all balance out. Um, and don't be a martyr. If you need to just stop for a minute, then do that because I guarantee you'll get more done when you're well rested and happy than you will if you grind for 48 straight hours and you're just living on coffee and gummy bears. Uh, you're the quality of your work. You, it's amazing. If I take a nap, it's amazing how much I can get done in like two hours compared to spending 12 hours exhausted. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I would just say, just enjoy the ride. Just enjoy it. Yeah, that's great. Courtney has a comment to that too. She says, I have a siesta every day. Even if I don't fully fall asleep, I rest. So that's I, right. <laughs> I like you, Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> She's been great in here chatting. It's so fun. Um, next, we have one from Jasmine. She asks, what keeps you motivated on the hard days? And what do you ultimately want your legacy to be? Ooh, I'm guessing I know which Jasmine this is. Was this Jasmine Brand? This is Jasmine Hillman. But oh, okay, okay. <laughs> that sounds like a Jasmine Brand question too. That, that's uh, true. <laughs> okay, what keeps me motivated on the hard days? And then what do I want my legacy to be? I think on the hard days, what keeps me motivated is knowing that I'm working towards something that's bigger than me. And on a hard day, if that's not enough to keep me motivated, then I'll just stop. I'll stop. I'll put the project down and I'll step away from it for a little while. And I'll just go sit on the couch and watch TV with my kids or I'll watch Law and Order and eat a bowl of Lucky Charms or, mm -hmm. you know, I'll do something to just just get back to me. Um, in fact, I was thinking about that, that this morning because sometimes as a leader and an innovator and a visionary, you get so, you, it's we're, we're amazing up here, right? When we're in the sky like an eagle and we can see the entire forest and we can see the water five miles that way and we can see the hills. And then you have to land and build a nest and all you can see is the five trees around you. It can be very difficult to remember your why, mm -hmm. um, the, the real why. And so, and it can make you feel unmotivated and, you know, am I really the ones to do this? Can I really pull this off? Why in the world is my idea a great idea again? I can't remember. I've been so busy trying to save up enough money to buy a printer or trying to get these people to finally call me back and take it and, and to work with me. I've been working so hard just to get my branding and things done and no one's buying my product. Why am I doing this again? And then you have to step back and go back up in the sky and remember and see exactly what you were aiming for and the beautiful panacea that you just know is waiting uh, to inspire you again. Or you have to go back and talk to people who've been there with you, who told you your idea was great, the customers who validated you, and like, okay, remind me why, why I'm doing this. Um, and so, you know, sometimes that's what you have to do to remotivate yourself. Uh, my legacy, what's my legacy to be that other moms over 40 uh, or women who feel like they may have had some odds against them saw that I at least gave it a try, that I that I went for it, uh, no hold bars, and that you know that I tried to change the world for my kids. More importantly, because everything I've built, especially Kandake Tech and Beyond the Ball, because they are so focused on my kids, uh, mm -hmm. I hope my kids turn out great. I hope they're able to look back and be like, yeah, she drove us crazy with all that stuff and made us do everything. <laughs> but I'm a sports medicine doctor today because of my mom or an NBA player or an NBA player and a sports medicine doctor. Or I'm an electrical engineer and I started a gaming company because of my mom or other people's kids. You know, we really 
focus on, on all kinds of kids. And so I, I, I think I would love my legacy to be the kids like, man, she was that one cool mom who actually didn't tell us to put the video games down. She told us to keep doing that and convinced our parents that we would still be great in life uh, if they leaned into our interests and passions with us as well. And so, yeah, I think, I think that's it. Just, and that's, a, that's a hard question, Jasmine Hillman. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think that's a good start. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's great. I think, gosh, Jasmine always comes up with these big, you know, futuristic questions. So I, it doesn't surprise me she sent that one in. Next, we have one from Julia and she asks, what has the last year looked like managing three businesses while in the midst of a pandemic? Ooh. Say, you know, it's really been cyclical. So um, at the point where, so the day I knew that coronavirus virus was real was the day I had a meeting um, with a major airport to kick off a project. And they said, look, travel is horrible. Uh, our industry is about to go down in flames for a while. We can't work with you. And then I got home and then the NBA shut down the games that night. And I'm like, oh crap, this is really, this is really happening. <laughs> and so you know, it was during that time that, and you know, the school district contracts I had, everyone said, look, we don't know what's about to happen. We're gonna have to slow down. And so it was during that time that I was able to work on Kanake I'm like, well, I've got nothing but free time. So I guess I can start growing this. And I was also able to do some things with Beyond the Ball and turn, turn our nonprofit model into a more virtual model. Um, and so I would say that, you know, it's, and it's just now that Expansion Solutions has started to have a few more, you know, those contracts come back with school districts. And so I would say that being a serial entrepreneur during a pandemic, it's just been very cyclical and, you know, God's been really good. So the day that this one is on the struggle bus, then this one might have a little bit of opportunity or um, when neither of them have projects going on, it's giving me a little time to innovate over here. Surviving on the PPP loans and the idle loans and uh, just really leaning into existing clients and say like, I'm sure there's something I can do for you right now. And being fortunate that some of them said yes. Uh, and then grants like TWU's grant and uh, the help, you know, the revived loan and opportunities with the deck, et cetera. So I would say that, um, I would honestly say that 2020 from a business perspective and innovation perspective was the best year for me as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Uh, emotionally, you know, of course, and from a mental health perspective, you know, it, it took a lot of adjustment for all of us because we lost family, you know, we saw way too much uh, on TV and on the news and had a lot of divide, but I, I would be doing an injustice to God if I didn't give him all the credit and say that 2020 was a wonderful year of growth for me in my business life. And it gave me the gift of Kandake Tech and our new platform, Vanaki.com. Yeah, that's amazing. This is uh, leads into this great next question from Jamila. She said, what was your biggest lesson learned during COVID? And do you plan to change anything moving forward from that in 2021? This is a group of very deep women. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Okay, ask the question one more time. So what was your biggest lesson learned during COVID? And do you plan to change anything moving forward from that in 2021? Ah, gosh. I would say that the biggest thing I learned was the power of people. Um, I grew my network exponentially in 2020. And I mean, people from all walks of life, CFOs of major sneaker companies to 12 year old kids who love anime to, to moms, you know, who are struggling to get their kids together in school, you know, to you name it. I've just, my entire network has just, I've just leaned into learning the perspectives of so many different people and to asking for help from so many different people from different walks of life. And, and I learned to just listen to my kids. I think it's just amazing. You know, and I've told a mom this before, and I'm sorry if I'm just harping on moms, 
but but I am one and you know it's a big part of where I am in my life and entrepreneurship but you know I was telling her that there are certain innovations that you can only come up with when you've lived through a kid and the problem in raising a kid or dealing just in the house realizing man I wish there was a way I could change their diaper easier or I wish there was a way that I could make sure that my I don't know milk and diaper inventory was right or there's so many different problems that someone who's a 22 year old who's never you know been, lived your life or had to deal with parenthood they don't know the problems and the nuances that you're dealing with every day so you're uniquely and all the way through through teenage years you're uniquely qualified to innovate on certain things that other moms and kids need and if we sometimes just lean into our kids a little bit more and lean into seeing motherhood or seeing your whatever stage you are in life as a gift and just look at the problems around you and solve them you know um i think yeah i think that would definitely that's that's definitely been the most beautiful thing to me i could not have seen banaki.com or kandake tech coming i could not have seen it coming but it was just from being willing to see problems and being brave enough to, I guess, try to solve them um, has has helped me in entrepreneurship. So for those of you who are like, I want to be an entrepreneur, I have no idea what kind of company I'm going to start. I have no idea where to start. Uh, just start looking around you. I think, you know, there's something I always say, like five feet to innovation in any room where you are, you're probably five feet from innovating because I'm sure there's at least one problem that needs to be solved around you. And if it's prevalent enough to you and others around you, then go for it. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And it, it's kind of funny because you also answered partly some of the next question from Jasmine again. <laughs> and it's a, it's a question that reads, what do you believe is the most important step before taking the leap into entrepreneurship? So kind of what you were touching on, but would you say it's a mindset first community or finding the right resources to leverage your business or vision? It's definitely mindset first. It's absolutely mindset. You have to be ready for rejection. You have to be ready to be broke. You have to be ready to fight for your ideas with everything in you. You have to be ready for the emotional roller coaster that will come with it. Because if you if you have all of that, then everything else becomes a little bit easier. And so so starting with mindset, yes. Uh, secondly, Write your idea down and ask around to see if it actually is a problem. Ask your target market if that is a problem and if what you're describing will help solve their problem. You can't innovate in a bubble and then put it on the shelf and expect people to buy it. A lot of what we've done with Banneke.com is talk to a whole lot of teachers, a whole lot of kids, and a whole lot of parents and ask them what their problems were and describe what we were trying to build and saying what parts of this actually matter to you. And so validate your idea before you invest a lot of money. And then once you've got it validated, build yourself a team. I have been blessed to have an amazing team. Uh, I've got Champ and Sean and Ami, who are all three interns, two of which are at SMU. I've got Georgia and Asada and Trey. And yeah, I've just got an amazing team around me. And, uh, and, you know, they just all believe in the same vision and we just work hard and it's just as important to me to be there for them and their own growth as it is to, to benefit from them being there for me. And so, yeah, just start building your team and go for it. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be fast. And if you're good with that and you want to just keep going, then enjoy the ride and get started. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, last question is from Tracy, and she's asking, what do you have in store for us in 2021-2022? Tracy, you I try to take it one day at a time sometimes. Um, <laughs> it, when I'm in the trees and when I'm above the trees, I, you know, I've got a five-year plan for you guys. I would say that this year, um, what I have in store for you Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I would say that I have a lot more growth. I'm looking forward to Banneke.com coming out here in the spring, early summer. You can actually go there now and sign up for our newsletter, B-A-N-N-E-K-Y.com, Banneke.com. 
So I'm really looking forward to that platform growing and doing some great things for kids around the world. We have kids around the world who are part of our Banneke squad. And um, Tracy, was that Tracy Irving? Yes. <laughs> I also look forward to me coming to you and saying, hey, I need more help. And <laughs> you. That's what I have in store for you, for sure. And then I hope to be invited to be a part of more conversations that help to elevate other entrepreneurs, you know, um, or for people to just reach out to me on LinkedIn. If you just want to talk, talking and helping other people helps feed my soul just as much as it may help you. And so, um, so yeah, I think, I think that's, that's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's only March, so there could be some new ideas coming to you in the near future, but Erica, gosh, thank you so much for just your wisdom and insight. I feel blessed by this conversation and I know that our audience has as well. And we will continue to hear from you because I know that there are so many things to come um, and you're going to be doing so many great things. And I know your boys will probably come up with something else that they want to do. So you'll have to, you know, create another company maybe. So, but I just want to thank you. And if there's any last thing that you'd like to say, feel free to, and then we will be done for today. All right. Well, I think I would just like to say thank you so much for even having me. I don't get invited to talk very much and which is totally fine, but this has been amazing. And I'm just honored to be a part of this conversation. Uh, and I appreciate all of you who joined us today to hear a few things that I had to say. That means a lot. I know a lot of your friends and family and colleagues. And I, I just pray that you're blessed and that you stay encouraged all 2021. We will not give 2020 any more credit. We are going to make 2021 amazing no matter what. And uh, we'll celebrate on the other end of this thing. <laughs> That sounds great. Well, Erica, thank you so much. I know that we will be hearing more from you and I'm excited that we get to connect and, and be friends and hear just your story. So thank you so much for all that you are doing. My pleasure. Thank you again for having me. Thanks, Erica. See you later. Bye-bye, guys.